Hello, I'm Amory Lovins. Welcome to the public forum on timing our choices for a safer and better airport. Proceed now or pause and learn. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to have two great aviation experts <clears throat> and myself address the community about big choices coming at our airport in Aspen. <clears throat> you know, timing is everything. Making wise choices requires making them at the right time, not too late, not too early. As the Pitkin County Board of County Commissioners makes fundamental choices about the future of Aspen Airport, we're here to explore how to make and keep Aspen's aviation safe, how to protect this community, its guests, its residents, its reputation, and its future while achieving other widely shared community goals. And we'll seek here to eliminate not so much what to do as when to decide and on the basis of what questions, what facts, and what sources of information. Our thoughtful commissioners <clears throat> are informed by 14 months of hard work by many citizens and staff in the ASE vision process by their own technical and legal advisors engaged by county staff, by three-minute oral comments and some written comments from the public, but so far by no experts except those selected by county staff, who also chose the vision processes, design information sources, and assignment of citizens to the various working groups. Such an information monoculture is better at creating an appearance of consensus than it is at exposing and testing all issues and facts in an open-ended, neutral, and critical process with diverse and independent sources of information. That's why I suggested today's forum to add some important missing information into the conversation. Many choices before our commissioners are pretty uncontroversial and widely supported. So our focus today is only on proposals for major rearrangement of the air side where the factual basis, completeness, logic, process, and timing seem to need much improvement. Now, the commissioners <clears throat> are considering an airside proposal that would overturn a 1995 vote in which the people rejected by three to two, almost a thousand vote margin, a runway expansion that would allow and even mandate 737 service. Fifteen years later, that original Aspen project has evolved in many welcome respects. It has added many important refinements. It's apparently retained a similar underlying purpose and rebranded its public description. And of course, <clears throat> it's been examined and informed by this elaborate vision process. And yet, as we'll see, the basic assumptions that drove this whole process should have undergone major revision by 2018 and basic rethinking in 2020, uh, especially <clears throat> given the uh, long-term implications of the global pandemic. But those assumptions have not yet been materially changed. That is, the, the vision process has been overtaken by events, planning for a future that no longer exists and is quite unlikely to reappear. The proposed airside changes, then, are no longer consistent with the new realities of aviation. This project is not a routine renovation, but a pretty complete rebuild. It's expected to be the biggest construction project in the county's history, costing over a half billion dollars, a budget that in normal dollars has roughly tripled since 2012. The county hopes FAA will pay for up to 90% of certain costs, leaving an estimated $157 million to be borne locally more than the county's annual budget, implying another bond vote. However, there is no assurance of FAA funding. Aspen has lost its place in the funding queue. FAA's reserve funds went elsewhere, uh, and Aspen's relationship with FAA seems in need of repair. Once there is a decision, followed by years of planning, design, approvals, and funding, the airport would also need to close for construction for some months with temporary new jobs offset by considerable disruption of the local economy. The laudable aim is to improve the airport's capabilities, safety, and impacts. 
The debate is over what outcomes will improve and for whom and how much, <laughs> whether the balance of good and potentially bad outcomes is desirable, whether the decisions balancing those things are soundly based, and our main focus today, whether those decisions are being made at the right time. Such big decisions require clear logic and strong evidence, hence asking the right questions in the right order and getting clear answers transparently based on correct and public information and, given this issue's checkered history, on irreproachable behaviors. In this case, county management chose consultants with a mandate to figure out how to make our airport viable for bigger aircraft. Many vision process participants picked up on that and publicly complained of the resulting perceived bias and how it has channeled the decision process. 44 citizens, including two former Aspen Airport directors, uh, one here, another who ran the FBO for 26 years as well, and some distinguished local pilots, uh, have publicly called for the commissioners to pause their airside reconfiguration choices for prudent clarifications, which we will explore here today. Several independent experts with no agenda and no interest in the outcome <clears throat> have been offering for many months to bring their new information before the commissioners. Having had no response, we'll therefore offer here uh, respectfully and publicly some missing questions and new or corrected information that we think could help our commissioners, our other public servants, and our fellow citizens to make better choices. We hope this forum may help our community turn Aspen Airport from safety challenge to safety leading while achieving the highest environmental and amenity standards, all with superior operational and financial performance. The Grassroots TV graciously offered to host this public conversation and make it available to all by various broadcasts and streaming, uh, with the studio cost financially sponsored uh, by private citizens in the public interest. So here's the format. I'm going to start with some extended remarks, then I will interview independent aviation expert Tom Keogh, uh, and then we'll form a little panel, say the uh, Tom, Dick, and Amory show, by adding Carbondale-based pilot Richard Arnold, former manager of Aspen and Telluride airports, head of the region's first charter air company and of a flight school, a Vietnam veteran, and a 20-year Aspen rescue uh, mountain rescue member who was very involved in more than 20 local aircraft accident recoveries. We also tried unsuccessfully, perhaps due to short notice, to arrange the participation today of some prominent project advocates whom we invited to join us, and I'm sorry none were able to attend, uh, probably our fault, but uh, <clears throat> at least our information will be avail available and I'm sure it will be discussed. Perhaps there will be some future forum for that. Now, contrary to some claims in the press, my 17 and 31 August written comments this year expressed no view on the proposed reconfiguration of the runway and taxiways, except a safety objection to their proposed unsafe crossing. Rather, my critique was about the basis and timing of the decision. I said an airside reconfiguration decision would be premature and unwise, so at least that part of the proposal should be paused. I think it's far too early to choose which or indeed to choose any airside configuration to pursue because the business and technological changes in aviation are too rapid, too profound, and there's absolutely no reason to try to guess their future trajectory now. Moving that fast brings far more risk than benefit. So let me start with two brief introductions, then we'll dive into the content. I am here solely as a private citizen. My general biography is on the websites of Rocky Mountain Institute and of Stanford University, where I'm an adjunct professor of civil and environmental engineering. I've been using Aspen Airport for nearly a half century, but besides flying many millions of commercial miles in an occasional simulator or military flight or light plane right seat. My aviation background includes serving on two defense science board task forces doing detailed studies of military energy, mostly aviation. Pentagon's the world's biggest airline. Uh, launching an Air Force weight reducing effort that saved over $10 billion. Leading RMI's uh, Pentagon sponsored study of aviation efficiency and its two updates visiting and lecturing at U.S. and European aeronautical research centers, 
advising a major airframe maker on design process and strategy, and co-founding and sharing an advanced composites firm uh, in this valley serving aviation and military customers. Last year, the industry's Air Transport Action Group chose me to deliver the keynote talk launching its World Sustainable Aviation Conference. The International Civil Aviation Organization had me address its similar conference, and I consulted for the CEO of one of the world's largest airports. My initial discussion partner today, Tom Keogh, is a 40-year commercial pilot and 22-year 22 airport, 22 airport designer with deep technical and business exper experience and expertise in the aircraft and airline and airport industries. Born in Toronto, he found his true calling wh while studying engineering and switched to aviation. And then in 15 months, he had all his ratings and was flying geophysics runs in South Africa and Australia. Having gained much prop and jet experience, ultimately over 30,000 hours, he became a first officer and flight ops manager with Air Canada subsidiary Air Transit. There he helped to develop air navigation uh, and area navigation and uh, microwave landing system procedures for short takeoff and landing airports, which he played a key role in designing, and aircraft, and that later permitted capacity boosting simultaneous takeoffs and landings on intersecting runways. Wow. He then sold aircraft for de Havilland, Saab, Fairchild Beach, British Airspace, and Bombardier where he helped design and market the RJ Airliner, later renamed the CRJ-700, and was one of its first trained pilots. He also became a U.S. citizen so he could be cleared for work on military black programs, and he built strong 30-year relationships with FAA and across the industry. After 25 years of managing a successful aircraft brokerage in Hong Kong, he became an equity partner, line pilot, and VP of flight ops for a fractional airline doing business in the U.S. and Scotland until its sale in 2003. Over many years, he helped develop and certify flight procedures, new airports like Laos, uh, airport upgrades for commercial service, Valdez, Alaska, and Innsbruck, Austria, uh, and general aviation, Atlanta, including sites as challenging as Greenland and Antarctica. And altogether, uh, Tom has participated with varying responsibilities in the design of some 22 airports. He currently conducts choice of aircraft evaluations, operational efficiency assessments, and economic analyses for a major fractional airline, and now technically retired to Newcastle and planning to move up Valley, he hopes to stay active in aviation and share his independent expertise with his new community. So, Thank you, sir. Welcome, Tom. And uh, Dick, I have introduced you, and we will, we will have uh, a panel shortly. Now. Tom, Dick, and I are contributing our time. We have no sponsor, no affiliation, no dog in this fight, no economic interest in the outcome. We are deeply committed to the future governance and the sound public discourse of this community, and we feel these goals could be furthered by two-way feedback or careful fact-finding and more temperate discussion. So let me start with the core issue, the relationship between the county and FAA. The vision report rightly focuses on what it calls the complex core issue at the heart of our airside choices. That is, under the existing county FAA relationship, the county is powerless to control which and how many airplanes can land at Aspen. Because any plane able to use our airport safely must be allowed to. It's called a non-discrimination rule. Thus, if the proposed airside reconfiguration enables large, that is, airplane design group, or ADG-3, planes to land safety in Aspen under FAA standards, they cannot legally be excluded or unjustly restricted. The county hopes to persuade airlines in future discussions, negotiations, to agree voluntarily not to land planes that are bigger, noisier, dirtier, or more carbon emitting than the community wants such as 737s and A319s. If those airline negotiations ultimately prove legal, if they succeed, if FAA approves them, and if any agreements are honored long run, they still would not bind any new commercial carrier nor any successor to a failed existing carrier. If the airlines don't accept such voluntary plane restrictions, and it's unclear why they would, or if the county lawyers find such agreements legally unsound, then the airside decisions will already have been made anyway. And that's because the Vision Committee uh, recommended that it reconvene to evaluate the success of 
those stakeholder negotiations and make an alternative airport recommendation if necessary. But when the airline negotiations were postponed due to the pandemic, the commissioner's major airside de decision process just moved ahead regardless. Now, importantly, even if decisions came after rather than before airline negotiations, any airline agreements would deal with only a small fraction of the airport's impacts. No, that's because no agreement would or could bind the private charter and shared operators, which I will collectively somewhat loosely call general aviation. Their operations were three-fourths of the airport's total last year and are nearer 90 percent now. So if you kindly look at slide two, you'll see data for 2019 on the left, 2020 on the right till August 1st. Uh, and it's very simple to interpret. You don't even need to read the fine print. The data are, are uh, shown in blue for our commercial airline service and in red for everything else, the, what I'm calling general aviation. Now, <clears throat> if you look a little closer, you'll see in, in 2019, 27% of the operations, the takeoffs or landings, were the commercial airlines, 73% the rest. 2020 to 1 August, about 10% commercial airlines, 90% other. And by the way, in 2019, 32 days had over uh, upwards of 200 flight ops. Five days had upwards of 300. That's a whole lot of traffic in a narrow valley. Uh, and you can see on the right, if you look at the second half there, that red uh, recovery of operations, not all that different from the previous year, that's almost entirely due to general aviation. There was very little commercial traffic because of the pandemic. Now, under the proposed county policy and FAA rules, many of the hundreds of private 737s could land here if we were a class three airport. So could older, dirtier, very noisy business jets. So could somewhat cleaner and quieter, but quite large business jets like the Gulfstream 650s owned by dozens of Aspen residents and many visitors, but too big to park here. So they would generally have to drop passengers and then go park someplace like rifle raising emissions. Now, any technically capable ADG-3 plane within Aspen's runway and uh, flight safety parameters could land not by local choice, but just through the mechanistic operation of FAA's non-discrimination rule. Thus, the Community Character Working Group's unanimous 30 September last year called to decrease general aviation operations with 10 continual votes for decreased general aviation growth and only one sort of marginal vote for maintaining limited growth. That's impossible to do under current FAA rules. Now, the vision report does suggest mandatory scheduling, that is slots, congestion fees, carbon fees, but it's unclear whether FAA would approve them or why any private operators who are far too diverse even to negotiate with would agree to waive their legal operating rights. Total traffic can be limited only indirectly by the county's control of types of gates, capacity of gates, numbers of gates, terminal capacity, and both uh, ground vehicle and airside parking. In other words, the only way under existing procedures to control how many planes and how many people come in is by creating such unpleasant congestion that people don't want to come here. That's not a good outcome. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's worth reflecting on. Now, in short, the Vision Committee's report concludes if we improved our airport to full Group 3 status, we would open the door to certain planes like the A220-200 that emit less greenhouse gas and other air pollutants, are quieter, and could attain our managed growth goal, subject to what I just said. But, they continue, we would also invite larger, more polluting, and noisier aircraft like the A319. End of quote. So that's the crux of the problem. That is, under the county's existing arrangements with FAA, we cannot have the benefits without the costs and risks. And those are hard to quantify for general aviation because as the Community Character Working Group bemoaned last 27 December, there is, they said, 
no thorough analysis or investigation due to lack of baseline data about general aviation. So the community can only guess about the impacts of those red zones and what they might be in the future on that chart you saw. However, there is an unstudied alternative that could, we believe, relieve this core dilemma. And later I'll explain why there seems to be no publicly explained reason to proceed now with the airside reconfiguration decision that could trigger these controversial risks and uncertainties. That is the, why the foundations of the plan have crumbled. But I was surprised and pleased to learn a few months ago from Tom Keogh, based on his personal experience with other airports and with FAA, that these community risks may be unnecessary if the county were to adopt an alternative arrangement that is not mentioned in the vision report, seems to have had no serious, if any, consideration in the vision process or the county's research or its consultant's advice. I know John Ely said it's been discussed forever, but I can't find where. The vision leaders wrote in the Aspen Times 15 September that it's simplistic and wouldn't work, but I wonder how they know that. As far as I know, the concept we're proposing came up only when my two August written comments described it, paraphrasing what Tom had told me. And my 30 August comments to the commissioners and the newspapers summarized it this way. I said, with FAA's blessing and likely help, the county could instead empower itself to make choices vital to community values while strengthening the airport's business model. How? An option adopted, I should probably have said pursued, by 28 airports since 2010, with more on the way, could retain county ownership and FAA safety rules and tower control, but regain county control of non-safety decisions. Such status, confusingly called a private airport, would let the county regulate the type, sizes, numbers, timing, noise, and emissions. In other words, subject to some uncertain details, nearly all current concerns. Of both, general tra uh, of both commercial traffic and the dominant but otherwise uncontrollable general aviation. This option briefly mentioned, and immediately dismissed by the way, in 2013, wasn't seriously explored. It should be now. It could change everything. Now, Tom Keogh wrote a letter 5 September to the commissioners and the Aspen Daily News elaborating that this shift could relieve, among other things, any concerns about inappropriate kinds of airport landing in Aspen. But he then cautioned as follows. He said, our language is important here. Technically, such a transition is called privatization to show that the airport's non-safety choices would no longer be subject to FAA rules. But the word is very misleading and best avoided. It encourages false rumors already being circulated that the airport would become privately owned and would lose FAA safety and funding. All that is categorically untrue. We can avoid confusion by using plain language, such as gaining local control of all non-safety issues. After this transition, the airport would still be owned, and I would add operated, and governed by a county entity just as it is now. Though officially called a private airport, it would remain classified by FAA as public use, hence eligible for FAA funding, especially for safety. It would stay under FAA safety rules, procedures, and tower controls, also vital to safe operations, public confidence, and Aspen's reputation. The county as proprietor, Tom continued, would shed FAA's non-discrimination rule and therefore could control virtually all operational aspects, including who can land, how many and which kinds of aircraft, when, and with what pilot training, with what noise and emissions, and paying what fees. FAA would remain a vital ally and partner, <clears throat> but would stick to safety. All choices important to community values and goals would be made locally. Those wanting more or less growth would have to be transparent about their goals. So I think that laid out pretty clearly that this could be a very interesting... Well, if I could just yeah, step well, in for please. a second. I can't emphasize enough the FAA's willingness to listen to this. They're not saying, well, it doesn't say that here on this piece of paper, so we can't consider that. They want to have a plan put before them that makes sense for us and makes sense for them. And if there's some negotiating to be doing, to use probably an inappropriate word, um, then they're willing to sit down and understand better 
what we want to do and how we want to do it. And uh, they're not necessarily confined by the rule book, as it were. This privatization, to use the wrong word again, um, is relatively new, even though age-wise it is not. This started in the 1990s, and it's been continued through now. But then they've upgraded the rules, I think, latest in it, 2010. They have. Only then did it really become attractive. It, it, it did, and it, yeah. it became attractive, ironically, maybe, because a lot of the airlines and a lot of the folks operating airports added to the original outline that the FAA had provided and decided that uh, that con the FAA decided that those points were well taken and thus the uh, process was upgraded, as you say, in uh, uh, 2012. I think it's a great document to work with now hmm. and it's particularly advantageous since they're so willing to talk about what our objectives are. And you're saying this on the basis of what, 30 year relationships with FAA? Uh, yeah, long relationships. When I was running the uh, operation out in Hong Kong, a lot of it dealt with the FAA bringing in new aircraft or doing certain certification issues here to make it easier to register over there. A lot of it was in Asia. That's why Hong Kong and ended up being. relationships have continued. They matured nicely, I must yeah. say. These are our guys that are very candid with me. Uh, and um, have no reason to say anything but what they really feel and how they feel things could be uh, tackled. Interesting. Now, it gets more interesting because last Thursday, as we record this, uh, 16 October, I was delighted when uh, David Whitestone of Benjamin Slocum from Hall and Knight, a respected East Coast law firm retained by the County of Special Counsel, spent an hour and a quarter helping our commissioners explore what I hoped would be our suggestion. Unfortunately, about 95% of that conversation was about a completely different concept, private airport ownership, which has very different motives, namely profit and costs and consequences than what right. we are discussing here. And that's why the lawyer said general aviation could not be restricted after privatization, not because of FAA rules apparently, but in their reasoning because the presumed private owner would earn less profit by restricting traffic. Well. The examples they cited were all about private ownership and or operation, not local non-safety control in public ownership and operation. So they didn't mention an obvious case of what Thomas proposed, namely the large self-funding, county-owned, county-managed, FAA-supported, highly admired, night-curfewed, noise-limiting, third biggest airport, or, sorry, second biggest airport in Los Angeles, the John Wayne Airport. Uh, and that airport continuously monitors noise. It bars some noisy types of aircraft from landing. It finds noise or pollution violators. It happens right away. It's like a, like a red light camera almost. And all of this has FAA approval. It's just the kind of local control Pitkin County would like to regain for Aspen Airport. However, <clears throat> the Holden Knight lawyers did agree FAA could have discretion to consider, for example, carbon fees and perhaps general aviation restrictions for a private owner. I was encouraged at the very end when Commissioner uh, Postman's questioning led to a brief foray into our actual proposal, a system akin to that of John Wayne Airport. And then the lawyer's responses seemed encouragingly consistent with what Tom and I had written. But that discussion was very brief and superficial. So I think as an important next step, I hope the commissioners will want to learn far more about that public ownership, public use, FAA safety, otherwise county controlled option. And since Tom's request of 14 February to meet with the commissioners was not taken up, we will hear from him here today and get into what I would hope the commissioners would be interested in learning. It would then be most helpful if one or both of these lawyers from last Thursday and Tom could discuss the option together in front of the commissioners. because. Whether or not Holland and Knight has arranged any such deals with FAA, I don't know. Tom has, as he will describe. And he also has a few advantages. He's, he lives here, not on the East Coast. He's had personal pilot experience in Aspen. He has no economic interest at stake, and he costs the county nothing. Uh, pooling his practical experience with these capable lawyers' welcome insights could be, I think, very helpful. All three of them know FAA well in their various roles. And having the commissioners hear their differing or convergent perspectives could be invaluable in executing their and Commissioner Postman's excellent idea that came up at the very end last Thursday, namely 
just what you're saying, Tom, mm -hmm. to articulate what the county wants and collaboratively ask FAA how it might be achieved. That's a Absolutely. very sensible way forward. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now this, this local control option we're going to hear more about from Tom can make explicitly, locally, transparently, and accountably the choices this community wants to make for itself about suitable and unsuitable aircraft attributes. So airside choices can then be made on their merits without fear of unwanted consequences. Those who want bigger planes should welcome this, I think, because for the first time the county could ensure that any newly allowed planes are not noisier or dirtier, and that would alleviate a lot of community concerns. But regaining county non-safety control could also solve three other very big problems. First is safety. Everybody agrees safety is the first issue. Now, several aviation organizations have called our airport and its surrounding air sp airspace the most dangerous in the continental U.S., and the data concur. The Aspen Airport and its airspace have had a stunning 50 aviation accidents in the last 55 years, due not to the airport itself, but to the mountain locale, the topography, the weather. Strikingly, by the way, just one of those 50 accidents was commercial, only one, when a hydraulic failure, 11 March 1998, made an incoming BAE 146 blow out its tires uh, and run on metal out of control and overrun the runway. Fortunately, it narrowly missed another plane and slid to a halt in three feet of snow with light harm to the plane and none to the uh, 77 passengers plus crew. Of note, by the way, it was sliding toward Buttermilk, of course, where the parking lot is 0 0.3 miles from the end of the runway and thousands of people gather at the X Games. <laughs> But the other 49 accidents were all non-airline, general aviation, most, of, most or all involving pilot error. Much of that error involved inadequate training and preparation for this area's terrain, winds, weather, special procedures, other challenging conditions. So the vision recommendation to give Aspen-bound pilots a pamphlet or guide to our airport's unusual and stringent safety demands is a very good idea. It's helpful, but it's insufficient. In contrast, regaining local control of non-safety issues would also let the county require, with FAA's needed and I suspect likely concurrence, oh, they're a safety it. agency, that pilots coming here verifiably know how to do so safely. That is, the county could require general aviation pilots to have special training to land in Aspen, just as commercial pilots do now. File flight plans could have to attach a certificate of real or virtual, like video or online simulator, Aspen-specific training, which is available to them. Excellent stuff out there, but it's not now required of them. The county could also even weigh in on FAA controllers' otherwise sole decisions about whether sometimes conditions are unsafe and require closure. Second big issue, general aviation. Freed from FAA's non-discrimination rule, the county could then select, restrict, and penalize or incentivize which types, attributes, and even numbers of non-airline planes meet the community's goals. The county's policy choices could therefore set criteria and charges not just for the commercial carrier 25% or nowadays nearer 10% of the airport operations, but for 100%, thus filling the enormous gap in currently proposed policy. The county may even become empowered to prioritize commercial over private aviation by slots, quotas, schedules, or fees, and manage general aviation traffic levels as the Community Values Working Group unanimously wanted. Otherwise, the planes and passengers, as I said before, can only be limited by running out of space uh, and hence creating a bad user and guest experience that would harm uh, Aspen's reputation and value and quality of life for everybody. Third, business model. <laughs> the airport could collect substantial fees, commensurate with the differentiated burdens that different users' choices impose on the community and the environment. It could charge for noise, pollution, carbon, or undesired attributes. It could rebate, conversely, to planes and operators who reduce those burdens, either revenue neutrally or profitably. It could craft the world's most advanced policies for aligning its pricing with community goals. Aspen Airport could embody national and global leadership, increase revenues, strengthen the business model, become a more attractive destination, protect public health, and improve the guest and residence experience. 
So this structural change should not inhibit continued collaboration with and funding by FAA to get Aspen the best available ground-based assets so all planes can use our airport safely, their primary mission, even in difficult conditions. Tom feels Aspen is far from modernity in those assets, and he'll describe how the airport could and must modernize to achieve the best safety levels, going well beyond what the vision report has discussed. I'm sure, Tom, you'll, or, uh, or Dick, you'll, you'll want to weigh in on that, too. Amory, Amory just yeah. on that point, there are, are two points that there may not fit into the uh, new dialogue there. The first is, in all the vision committee meetings I've met and with uh, some of the members outside those meetings and that sort of thing, I've never heard it discussed to any great extent, maybe discussed or mentioned, but even that I have a hard time remembering any of it, is single engine performance on that, uh, in that area, uh, both departure and arrival. Um, in other words, if one engine clogs out. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you lose it in either instance, which are critical uh, areas of the flight spectrum, um, there's a lot going on very quickly. I think if one were to include the loss of an engine in either one of those situations, then there would be one aircraft of all the aircraft that are available today to use this airport commercially would pop out very quickly. And that, ironically, is the one that's being used. It's single engine performance for getting out of situations where it's lost an engine is significantly better than what any of the competitor aircraft are. And there's, there's reasons for that, um, other than just the one I'm going to quote, but the main reason would be the fact that their engines are attached to fuselage, therefore the loss so of the engine, inboard. it's the same if you blow a tire on, your, on the freeway, um, you always go that way. Well, when you're inboard and you're centerline thrust, it's the same thing. You go forward and you can control yep. the airport, airplane a lot quicker. And secondly, I bet you there's not a soul in all this Roaring Fork Valley who hasn't seen an animal hit by a car at the side of the road. That can happen to an airplane with devastating issues. I mean, airplanes are very delicate uh, relative to your car structure and that sort of thing. So when you hit something, you make a mess of it very quickly. So I think there's that. The other thing and, that... And, and just to contrast that, <clears throat> if you had a, a bigger plane like a 737 whose engines are not near the center line but outboard, if one of them goes out, you'll slew yaw. around, you'll yeah, yaw. Yeah, yeah, very and that makes it hard to control, and yeah. it may make it impossible to complete the maneuver yeah. you need yeah. to clear the mountains. It, it really, it could. And, and it's split second. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the jet engine takes time to spool up. And you're spooled up on takeoff, but you're not on landing. So you've got uh, a lot to deal with very quickly, and uh, you better be on your toes. That, and it, actually, there's a briefing the, the crew will make, inbound, uh, properly trained crew, they will make relative to that situation. This is what we're going to do if we lose an engine on landing here or on the approach. So the they, commercial pilots get that briefing, but general aviation? Well, I don't know. I think there's some general aviation uh, folks have done it. I, the only one I've... I, I'm had, sure the, the kind of firms, you know, the, 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 the major operators, can you, as an airport manager and FBO, can you speak to whether they, they do that? Well, there's not a lot of information for and directed to single engine aircraft other than some of the major turboprops now. Yeah, but and here we're talking also about a twin engine plane. Do we know whether the non-airline pilots do that kind of brief? Well, the in some of the senior uh, GA operations, you'll get it because the insurance <coughs> will make them get it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there is that. But there may be some Probably. private and corporate planes coming in that don't. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, you can go out to the uh, okay. FBO. But I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. No, there, absolutely. Exactly. I'd, be, I'd say there's a Thanks. probably and a majority in that case. The, the other point I'd like to yeah. make is that we use the airport here in inbound one direction, mm. outbound the opposite direction. That's <laughs> critical that that get looked at. I mean, landing and taking off with a tailwind <coughs> is one of the riskiest things you can do in flying. It's just very difficult. And I've seen some pretty hairy experiences out there in my research for this project that had airplanes almost hanging over the end of the opposite end of the runway that they'd landed at with hot brakes, really hot brakes and smoke coming out of them. 
And it's, it's something that doesn't need to be that way. And I don't know what kind of artificial thinking goes into the fact that you can't approach from the other end, but I can tell you from a recent approach I made here, you can do it and you can do it gracefully and you just squeak over three degrees of glide slope as opposed to the two and a two and a half we're used to doing at every other airport, including this one from the other so end. So not, not an important difference. So not are, a you, significant say, are difference. you saying you, you actually did that? Yeah, no, I did it, and I, but I flight planned it. So when I got here... So, so you they, filed the flight plan? I filed the flight plan coming from where I was coming from, and I said I wanted to use that runway. Of course, it's a captain's decision anyway, in any case. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not... That wasn't doing any favors. If I asked for that runway, um, it could be closed. <laughs> well, they wouldn't let me collide then, but... I mean, it is the captain's decision as to what runway you want. And uh, I know there's been accidents this here... This way or that, that way? Yeah, yeah, aircraft accidents here that have been, in large part attributed to downwind landings. Unfamiliar with the airport, unfamiliar with the environment, but also landing in, you know, in this case, 15 plus knot tailwind. Absolutely a no-no from a flying perspective. But after this event the other day, I had a friend uh, call the tower and they were told that the reason that, that my airplane and others, I didn't know or hear or hear any others, had landed that way was because of the winds and the winds were less than four knots at the time. So it wasn't significant. But the other thing was that we've been landing <laughs> other airplanes that way. And I don't believe that was the case because we listened to uh, uh, Aspen all the way in virtually from Denver. And because uh, we wanted to make sure we would get that end of the runway. So we didn't hear anybody else get that. Transparency well, I, I, issue I, I just wonder where the <laughs> direction is to make everything come that way. It's not FAA to be sure. I mean, that's a safety issue of the highest order. Okay, so you, to sum up as a non-pilot, my understanding of what you're saying, and you pilots can correct me, is that it is a lot less safe to have airplanes going both ways than to have them going one way. Oh. Uh, and we, we have done the, the both ways, the head-on yeah. traffic for a long time. Yeah. And it's not all that hard in your view to... Well, I'd like to know it, why it is that way. Yeah, I mean, at least it be, should be carefully explored. Yeah, if in a there's public, a solid reason, public way and I sure don't see local it. pilots weighing in. Yeah. To yeah, uh, yeah. okay. You good. know that that takeoff out of Aspen as today in the general way, the first thing to do when they put the wheels in the well, are start to peel off to the right. So the inbounds have a straight inbound on on the equipment, and they go up and they climb up ten thousand feet, and then they can go back toward Denver. It, it works because everybody knows the game, I guess, but I, I've had talked to pilots in here who are not happy about that. If they get busy with an engine problem, for instance, on the outbound leg, then they better pay attention to that or they're going to hit some of our granite clouds. And that's more important than worrying about the guy on the inbound leg. And also, I presume if I'm some minor general aviation pilot and I'm on this proposed taxiway crossing the runway, oh. I might not know or remember to look both ways, or I might not be able to see <laughs> far enough both ways to know there's folks going every yeah, which way. I, that, that's <laughs> a kind of sin, too. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I, you've told me about that, and I've seen the plan, but I don't think that would have lasted very long anyway. I think it was somebody's idea that didn't have any merit or shouldn't have had any merit. But you know, the, I, I've, I I've heard FAA has already turned it down oh, yeah. previously. But, oh, okay. yeah, they wouldn't go for that. They, it's, it's, you know, I think, to be fair, a lot of people put a lot of effort and a lot of thought into that. that process, the vision process. Yep. It just needs to go a little further than what it's gone with some practical experience um, guiding them a little bit where they go because the folks aren't uh, pilots for the most part and they can't ask the right kind of questions. They can't answer the right question when it is asked. So I think it's a very difficult situation to do it. And as you articulated when we started here, this isn't a get uh, try and damage what's already been done. That's fine. That's that's a cornerstone from which we can work now because there was a lot learned. But, but I, I don't mean to be critical on these things. These are observations that need to be reviewed. Yep. Totally agree. We need to get more information out to the inbound pilots because there are many that come in here that have never been here before. Right. And I always like to say there's a 28-year-old commercial pilot who's flying his boss in from someplace in the south, sure. Texas, Louisiana or someplace. Some big company. Never been in here. Yeah. Never flown on the mountains. 
and yet the FAA says, yes, but he's qualified and commercial pilot. And that sort of gets a blanket coverage yeah. of any airport. Well, we're not any airport. And one of the things that I'm going to do for sure is to create a how to fly into Aspen yeah. and how to depart into Aspen. Yeah. Because years ago, the, the policy was always land uphill, mm -hmm. take off downhill. Well, that's fine for some airports, but in this valley, it's still being used. Mm -hmm. And if you add a wind to that, which is a headwind for a takeoff, that's great. Yeah. It's not great for a tailwind landing, which happens Precisely. two or three minutes later. Yeah. And uh, when I was the airport manager, I witnessed a Learjet, and I interviewed the crew after this accident, that uh, were told to land on uh, 15, winds 330 at 15, and 1533315. And he said, We were confused. <laughs> Does not compute. Heck, the tower said to go ahead and land. Yeah. And we'd never been in here before, he said. So we came in a little high and, you know, 10 knots fast. Well, here they are coming in and probably at 150 to 160 knots. And they landed long. I heard this on the radio, and I could just feel it coming. Mm -hmm. I ran outside of my office, and I watched as they went by the middle of the runway. Still airborne. They were probably 15 feet in the air yeah. still, still going Ooh. fast. Yeah. So I watched them go off the end of the runway, brakes smoking and everything. Mm -hmm. Luckily for everybody, it was a wintertime, and there was snow at the end of the runway. And they piled right into the snow. Yeah. And they got out, and we all went down to help them out, and the passengers, everybody was okay. And I interviewed them after that, and uh, they said, well, they cleared us to land, and we were trying to be safe and yeah. carry a little extra airspeed. Mm. The, the point of the story is that this airport needs education for pilots. Absolutely. Whether they're general aviation, the airlines do a great job yeah. with their pilots. Yeah. You're not allowed to come in here unless you've already been in here with a, with another captain at least right. once or twice. Right, yep. And they share that information. But the guy flying here who's new, who's never been here before, the FAA says he's qualified, well, to some minor degree. Yeah. But those of us who do a lot of mountain flying here know that this is a very unique special airport. Yes. It is to be and I, I say that as a, uh, as a flight instructor, and I've been teaching flying since the 70s, and focusing on mountain flying, and uh, with 10,000 hours in the air, most of it right around here, yeah. um, I've seen too much of it. Yeah. And as if we said, being a member of Mountain Rescue for well over 20 years, I've been involved in over 25 accidents out of the 50. Mm -hmm. And most of them were body recoveries. And that's tough to look at the story of that accident and say, well, why didn't they yeah. blink? Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. They yep. could have. Well, you're talking but, about looking after a bit of that blink anyway, yeah. so that's so a, good. A, a general point coming out of this valuable discussion <clears throat> uh, is that the airport is not just a place, it's not just equipment, it's not just concrete on the ground. It's a whole system that reaches way beyond the airport into the culture, the training, what's in the head of the pilot. Clearly. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. good. Thank you. Well, with that in mind, uh, safety first, as everybody agrees, I want to go back to decision process. As it seems to me, the transparency and the quality of community conversations could improve if advocates of more or fewer passengers and of bigger or smaller planes had to be explicit about who they are, what they want, and why they want it, and what it would mean. Remember that county management has completely controlled the vision process and the experts allowed to inform its participants. Many participants, publicly and privately, complained of a feeling of bias and being corralled. And it's hard to discuss whether to receive bigger planes 
when the county's consultants believe that they were charged with figuring out how to accommodate bigger planes, uh, creating incentives to match that goal. I am not impugning anybody's integrity when I tell you from more than a half century's experience <coughs> in and with consulting that consultants who are honest and not venal still commonly select evidence and shade messages in a way that will please the clients and elicit further engagements. Uh, proverbially stated, whose bread I eat, his song I sing. This is my impression from these consultants' briefings and presentations. I've read a great many of them. When you further learn that the county's capable noise consultant was reportedly told not to measure takeoff noise, and noise measurements were misleadingly averaged, and air quality measurements were taken not at buttermilk but at the ABC, it's reasonable to ask whether data crucial for sound community choice are being molded to fit agendas. Now, some in the community wonder whether general aviation's influence or other powerful interests might be driving public choices. I don't know. I noticed in the Aspen Times 2011 that a desire for a second FBO had triggered the 2012 plan update for runway expansion. Now, I am not here, certainly not, to speculate about histories or motives. I take at face value that our commissioners are simply honestly doing their level best for reliable and more benign air service. But on that assumption, there are some disturbing discrepancies between what the community has been told and what I think the facts show. I'm troubled by disparities in what the vision process participants and commissioners were reportedly told in 2019 about FAA's requirements. And let me give you an example. Professor Greg Walden's 20 March 19 aviation law uh, brief to the vision kickoff in slide six omitted the local non-safety control option we've started to discuss, but also it left the impression that the county has no choice but to upgrade the air side to full class three or risk being downgraded by FAA, losing commercial air service and having to pay back millions of dollars in past grants. He offered only two options, which we see in slide seven. You see on the left, and by the way, the red is in the original slide, it says FAA has indicated that remaining a non-standard airport as we are now is not a viable option. Unintended consequence, FAA downgrade to class two, ADG two, and seeks to recoup grant funds for past <coughs> ADG three improvements. And then, you notice that's only one of two options. Uh, <clears throat> participants reacted with alarmed comments that you can read, like FAA rep, which he wasn't, he, he left the agency 29 years earlier, seemed to be threatening in his remarks about the importance of ASE becoming a class three airport and the dire consequences of remaining a class two, two and a half. So such threats, the way they were heard, surely helped motivate participants to follow the suggested agenda, even though two pages later, FAA is downgrading the airport and demanding huge refunds is described as a theoretical possibility, not a probability, and it's inconceivable to me that today's FAA would behave that never way. Never happened. <laughs> yeah, it never happened. Never happened. Interesting. You, you've got to remember, the FAA is a, a safety agency. That's all they're interested in. If they put money into something to make it safer at some point in time, they're not going to turn around and say, We're, we want it back or you pay us outright. That's not the, the agenda they're running to at all. Right. So I think it's, yeah. uh, it's a misnomer now, to do that. Or similarly, the Aspen Times reported the county manager's recent remark that FAA won't fund an airport project in Aspen that doesn't meet class three standards. And yet I read in Valerie Brown's minority report she says, we have learned that FAA has not threatened to, rem to remove the modification of standards ASC currently operates under. They have warned that they would not necessarily award grants for ADG3 improvements. However, they haven't said they won't fund such projects. 
I'm quite confident, she says, that the influential GA clientele that operates in Aspen and the airlines would not stand for anything except excellent conditions on our current airside configuration. We've also learned that communities can and have been able to influence decisions made by FAA. So there's some cognitive dissonance here, and it's hard to resolve because county conversations with FAA and even who has them are apparently secret. I think Ms. Brown is right, but we could usefully ask Tom when we get into discussion later, and he knows FAA very well, for his impressions <coughs> of its likely attitude if approached collaboratively and constructively by the kinds of respected advocates that are needed anyway to reset the county's relationship. There are also disquieting gaps in the thinking behind the assumed growth forecasts and goals and public purposes. For example, Valerie Brown notes that through an entire year of study, the ASC Vision Committee never once heard concerns expressed about there not being enough seats on airplanes. We never heard from the lodging, restaurant, or retail communities that visitors were complaining that they couldn't get to Aspen. The real estate markets were tight then. They're completely sold out now. So I wonder, where's the capacity to host 27% more guests by 2050? You can't build a bunch here because of topography. And with winters getting shorter and snow less reliable and abundant, what exactly is going to attract all those extra guests through the critical winter peak travel season? Perhaps a working group dug into these issues, but if so, their evidence and reasoning don't seem to be public. It's also just complex and hard to discern if the community and its various interests are truly prepared to accept all NEG3, that is larger airplanes wishing to land here, and all their passengers on both commercial and private planes. So, for example, would 737s carrying more people mean less frequent flights, hence higher peak loads on airport and transport infrastructure, or at least similar frequency and thus more total people, hence more conflict with core community values but perhaps more profit for promoters. Would larger planes really mean fewer peak airline flights, as we are told? Well, especially if delayed flights stack up <laughs> and if, like, building highways, th think for lading 82, more capacity creates more traffic. Why wouldn't that apply <laughs> to air travel? How would an airline manage bigger planes' lumpier capacity in a market with large seasonal or even weekly swings? So bigger planes may make money only in pretty tight peak periods, as Valerie Brown's traffic analysis showed, but they'd lose money for most of the year, uh, making uh, frequent type switching costly. And in the new market logic of point-to-point -point advantage, Excellent. I'm sure we'll hear about that, yep. isn't the winter likely to be smaller planes, not bigger planes? Yep. And more convenient schedules. Yeah, and to more places. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, we'll get to that. Now, perhaps most importantly, have we really thought through the full medical and reputational risk of a potential, say, 130 casualty catastrophic event plus mm -hmm. any victims on the ground? I'm sure this was always... Something you yeah. woke up with and went to bed with as an <laughs> airport manager. You know, this community is blessed with a terrific five-star level three trauma center hospital with casualty capacity matched to a, a multi-car or small plane accident. And I've been gratified to learn it, it has an improved mass casualty plan designed for up to 70, roughly like a CRJ 700 or a school bus. But when you think about what that would really mean, smaller is better, bigger is worse. The trend I'll mention towards smaller planes with point-to-point -point routes could greatly reduce the risks, whatever those are, of overwhelming our emergency capacity. Bigger planes would enhance that risk. Aspen has a sterling reputation for commercial flight safety, not general aviation. That reputation cannot afford even one accident. It's troubled reputation for non-commercial flight safety with roughly one crash per year on average, dozens of people killed so far, needs major improvement. And as we've heard already, comprehensive safety is about the whole system of the airport, the airspace for tens of miles around, maybe beyond, the proficiency and training of inbound flight crews from all over. So the vision agenda scarcely begins to address this top priority of safety. I know they thought about it, I think our professionals here would say they don't seem to have thought nearly as much it, about it. That's a case of not going far enough. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I don't think anybody was trying to ignore it. There was just maybe, again, questions that 
should have been asked that they didn't know enough about the scenarios and the responsibilities to ask. Yeah. Simple, but it needs to be corrected. You're yeah, right. and, and, and uh, the, the, the key point here also is that regaining local control of non-safety issues would greatly strengthen the county's hand in building first-class safety for all, for example, by being in a much stronger position to require that Aspen-specific yes. general aviation mm -hmm. pilot training. Okay, now we turn to timing, which is really what got me concerned about uh, the current process. Why the rush? It's not airline fleet turnover. Here's why. You know, before Tom discusses restructuring the FAA relationship and comprehensively improving airport safety, I want to discuss timing. Why the commissioners, in my view, should not choose one or any airside reconfiguration option now or for many years. And by the way, you'll notice this part of my remarks focuses on the airlines. That's because that's where the vision process focused. But remember, that's not where most of the air, airport's operations are. Now, the Aspen Daily News reported 31 August that the stated impetus behind the ASE vision process was the belief of many local officials and private consultants that the CRJ 700 aircraft serving the local commercial market will be discontinued in the next two to 10 years necessitating airside improvements. So I look back to where did that come from? Well, the 2012 airport expansion push and the Javiation-based master plan claimed that the CRJ-700 jets we use now would be over half gone by 2021, next year. That threat was repeated in 2014, as you can see in slide three. And let me, it's actually even repeated in 2018-19. So, Let's look at, at slide three. Uh, it's a briefing to the commissioners, uh, 16 December 2014. Uh, and here's what it said um, in slide four. You see in the last three bullets on the left uh, that the CRJ 700 is said to have an estimated operational lifespan 15 to 17 years. Mm. Tom, you helped design and market that plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you, you think? know, they, it's it's an unarguable situation anyway because that manufacturer at any time can go through certain FAA just tests and uh, exercises and extend it. Yeah. So if it's eighty thousand cycles today, which it is cycles, not uh, right. hours, they could easily jack that up to hundred. And with the enthusiasm about that aircraft in the marketplace today, it'll likely happen. My guess is it would have happened if there hadn't been that transition from Bombardier to Mitsubishi, mm -hmm. and that's still spooling up. Yeah. So okay. the, the 700 is in very good shape going forward from a marketing and sales and point of view. I gather it's, it's considered an unusually rugged and reliable plane that might therefore last longer than some of its uh, De Havilland has always been known. It started as a bush pilot manufacturing facility, and they, none of that has worn off completely. Mm -hmm. They're very sturdy. Um, one of the things we did when we changed the uh, 700 from a corporate aircraft to a, uh, an airliner sort of bombardier. Yeah. Yeah, um, was there were extra ribs added to it. There was extra baggage added to it. Obviously not enough for today's people. The people come here and move house and home when they come here. But the fact of the matter is there, there were substantial things. Brakes were upgraded. Uh, the engines were changed from right and left-handed to all both sides work. The, uh, the uh, there was substantial, substantial ruggedness put so into it. Solid. Air. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, they said it would it would uh, have an estimated operational lifespan, 15 to 17 years. First retirements, they said, estimated to begin 2018. Over half of U.S. fleet anticipated to retire by 2021 with remainder retired by 2025. And then if we look at slide five, at what the community was told, these are the briefs given in a great many public events, uh, in response to why are we considering changes to the airport, the answer says, the CRJ-700 now provides 95% of our commercial jet service, but this aircraft is being retired within the next 10 years. Remember, this was said in 2014. And continues, if this community wants commercial service at a similar level, 
to that offered today, we will need to increase the distance between our taxiway and runway to accommodate larger wing spans. In case anyone missed that implied threat uh, that of only being able to get here by surface vehicles or private planes, the community question slides added that during the environmental assessment, and I quote, we as a community can seriously consider how development at the airport aligns with our values and whether maintaining regular commercial service operations at the airport is important to the community. Now this well-publicized binary choice between expanding to a full class three airport and losing airline service, impliedly altogether, built the intended momentum for runway expansion and separation culminating in our commissioner's current choices. The same briefing, by the way, it contemplated a schedule implying we're running most of a decade late, but meanwhile, the strategy's basic premise proved wrong by probably at least two decades. Even before the pandemic put aviation into suspended animation, traditional business models and route structures on life support, and by the way, uh, made it a lot more logical mm -hmm. to keep running this plane longer. And when last reported on 31 March 2019, 88% of the global CRJ-700 fleet, that's, that 88% means 290 aircraft, remained in service. Doesn't sound like they're about to be half gone next year and all gone by 2025. Uh, so my 31 August 2020 letter documented 40 recent CRJ-700 leases to American, 29 to another carrier, mostly running to 2030. And today, CRJ-700s, as Tom just said, are in strong demand as traffic plummets, so smaller planes and point-to-point -point routes beat hub-and-spoke, and also VIP segment conversions of CRJ-700s to more luxurious uh, CRJ-550s, 10 plus 20 plus 20 seats, are winning strong customer and airline mm -hmm. points. Developing routes quicker than they ever anticipated. It's really, a, it's a great airplane for doing that. And that's... That's where, you know, we've heard about the fact that the Delta pulled its aircraft out of here because the traffic wasn't there. Well, that's good reason. Not, uh, obviously, Delta was trying to refine their economics a bit, too. But the fact of the matter is, they put those on other routes that were being developed by bigger aircraft that they could no longer get the uh, uh, number of passengers. So it's lower cost and more profitable for them exactly. to move the airplanes. Perfect sense. From Aspen, Hadrian, Montrose to more important routes. Perfect sense. No. Absolutely. Yeah, you're not, not because of concerns about the airplane. Oh, no, they love the air. I mean, the Sky West flies for all three airlines, as you know, and um, they love the airplane. Mm -hmm. They love it. So, so we had these rather draconian, uh, some would say menacing, <laughs> initial framings of these airplanes are going to go away quickly. And I think reality has gradually made those initial claims of imminent retirement softer and fuzzier and later. Uh, you know, I, I could go through a bunch of examples of that, and I noticed the vision leader's 14 September 2020 letter in the Aspen Times asked, did the committee assume CRJ-700 planes would retire? No, we found that airlines would likely use it for another decade. But then they vaguely claimed rising maintenance costs and implied with that analysis that that would require a half-billion-dollar decision now to avert getting to an average fleet age of 26 by 2030, uh, even though you know there are a lot of less distinctively rugged planes older than that that are in successful oh, yeah. service. And so Tom wrote to the paper 5 September, I'd written 31 August, explaining just what he told you, that the avi aviation industry works on spreadsheets, not clocks, uh, not, not calendars. Planes are run as long as they need to yeah. and make money. Absolutely. Absolutely, and it will someday be outdated. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. They someday it'll are. retire. Absolutely, go to, to go to second and third world countries, which is the retirement area for yeah, most but, airplanes. <clears throat> yeah, and I noticed 16 October 2020, the Board of County Commissioner heard from commissioners heard from the their aviation consultants who were again uh, and unusually vague, confirming that the CRJ 700 had significant further life. And they've reframed retirement as more about customer preference for new equipment, which is normally something you do with cosmetic refresh or even absolutely a, a reconfiguration like the 550s. Sure. Exactly. Uh, yeah, rather than by costly airframe re replacement. Yeah. Uh, 
It, it might be interesting to note, too, that airplanes are bought in two things. First, you decide what the missions are going to be, because you never, never buy an airplane for one dedicated route. That isn't going to happen. So you buy your airplane, and you make sure it fits performance-wise into these slots that you're anticipating using it in. And they can go out some kind of years, because they don't buy all the airplanes at once. They buy sequentially, and then these guys open up a new route, and then it gets a bigger aircraft, and they move it downstream. So that, that's, that can happen. But the, the whole thing with acquiring airplanes is the performance. If the airplane doesn't perform in the missions, the majority of the missions you want, you don't do it. Uh, one of the biggest things is it can carry all the luggage and the passengers. Well, <laughs> they don't get all the luggage in here to Aspen every time, but all the rest of the attributes are there. So they, they took advantage of it and bought th those aircraft. There's, the other thing is the economics of it. And the economics doesn't have anything to do with the airline. It has everything to do with the lessor, which more than 50%, significantly more, are leased, not owned. And then the economic factors come in, and if you can't get the economics you need, you move to plan B. And that's just the way it is. And there's good reasons for doing all those things. And it's not a question of somebody who perhaps I have a high time pilot or something. They have very sophisticated groups in the lessors deal, the banks deal, and, and in the ownership of the airlines of how to acquire a new aircraft. It's not an overnight decision, I can assure you. Yeah, I think the interesting thing here is that the county's advisors are no longer com committing their reputations to those six-year-old forecasts that have proved about as, as wrong and yeah. as forecasts can be, and they're Pretty getting wronger as we go. And they're not the first time that those mistakes have been made. I mean, yeah. they, they, forecasting is hard. It's very difficult. <laughs> and yeah. What if we had another pandemic now? Uh, I mean, this one isn't over. What if another one hit? Well, our third wave looks worse than the second. Well, and I'll tell it, you. And we don't know about immunity. We don't know yeah. about vaccines and how long it lasts and all that. You can't but, plan for but I think the interesting thing here, though, is that the vision committee was still told and advocates continue even now to assert those discredited 2014 yeah. assumptions. Yeah. Uh, you know, Valerie Brown's minority report says just last year, the committee was told that the CRJ 700 would be retired in a few years and is no longer available. Uh, <clears throat> 16 October 2019, Bill Thompson, along the county's main airport informant, advised the technical working group that more and more signs are pointing toward the inevitable retirement of the CRJ-700, perhaps sooner than previously thought. Two months ago, 17 August 2020, Michael Miracle wrote the commissioners that the CRJ-700's retirement is happening faster than expected. And he cited that temporary winter suspension of Delta that we, we just discussed. I think it's a lot simpler than a route the airplane. You know, Delta's second quarter sales were down 88% from the previous second quarter with $5.7 billion mm -hmm. losses. And they, they plan their third quarter capacity this year down at least 75%. Mm -hmm. So of course they, they're they bleeding cash. They deploy the plane oh, to wherever, yeah. wherever they can Very try tough. to make survival cash. Well, and of course there's international flights are all dead yeah. too, and that's where the money is. Yeah. And then <laughs> most more recently, 3rd September 2020, a lawyer, Barry Vaughn, proclaimed, the 700 is going away. Maybe not this year, but soon. That's a fact. It's not a fact. <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Soon enough to matter, no. In short, the vision process and its advice to the commissioners are built on vague, rhetorical, unsupportable, and now we see false claims that fleet turnover within a decade with no alternative, I'll get to that in a minute, demands a half billion dollar decision now. Curiously, by the way, that investment to enable new planes to come in is never included in discussions of their supposed economic advantages. You can't play a shell game. The costs actually yeah, yeah. have to come to roost somewhere. Now, Tom and I published three letters in the last two months documenting why the CRJ-700 fleet, ideally suited to Aspen other than luggage, <laughs> is only halfway or so through its currently rated life. So saying it's about to retire is kind of like saying that a 32-year-old person that is halfway from birth to nominal retirement age is about to leave the workforce. As <laughs> uh, planes current 80,000 cycle rating should let it run well into the 2030s. And as Tom just reiterated, we explained in the letters, that rated life is very likely to be further extended under standard industry uh, practices. And uh, 
course, Tom's an expert in such analyses. He probably knows more about this airplane than anyone this side of its Canadian manufacturer. I wish that were true. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> I don't think I'm that good. But well, they, they, a lot of people are aware. I just we haven't been had the right people at the table at times when okay. some of that's debated. But um, anyway, I, I think let's start a, a new yeah. now and, and try and take advantage of but, some of this. But, and I, I, I think. There, there have been some hand-waving claims of high maintenance burdens that will push that plane out anyway. I don't think that's backed by analysis, but you do analyses like that all the time. All the time. That, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. where the pond I'm fishing in right now. And uh, just to comment further on that, there's very few, and I know personally because I sold those airplanes to SkyWest, um, they are on power by the hour or some other maintenance program. So they're planning for this eventuality that they'll extend or whatever. Power by the hour is a way that the engine maker leases the propulsion service and they have very sophisticated telemetry yeah. and preventive maintenance because they get paid for reliable spins. spins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and they are extremely good at that. They know exactly yeah. when an engine's going to yeah. fail from what and they fix it first. Well, and, and the whole airframe is full of sensors now, too. I mean, it's remarkable the kind of warnings you get yeah. and the kind of redundancy you have if it's a near-term warning. So it's yeah. a lot of sophistication. You're not just listening for squeaks. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> but, but the point is that, that <coughs> also that vague allusions to general industry behavior don't reflect the specific airplane's exceptional ruggedness and reliability, right. nor its value in this market. And now, of course, the pandemic has greatly strengthened the case for running those planes longer because distressed airlines have to milk existing assets longer and avoid costly new Well, they purchases. get a higher load factor yeah. with these than they would on the bigger one because the, the audience is down. So if you can get the higher load yeah. factor yeah. out of a smaller airplane, the exactly. economics The commissioner's sense. actually asked whether those business conditions have changed in the pandemic, and the consultant's answer I thought was unresponsive. It was focusing on scope clauses. Oh, nothing to do with it, yeah. Okay. Now, there we were told there were no alternatives, so we dug into that a bit. Uh, and it turns out there are three alternatives to the CRJ-700 that can use our airport with no airside modifications. Uh, and therefore, bigger planes would not be needed for Aspen to keep commercial service if the CRJ vaporized. Uh, there are, and uh, these are excellent, commercially available, highly suitable, and by the way, non-Embraer alternatives mm -hmm. that were and remain, I think, improperly excluded. First is the somewhat bigger successor to the CRJ-700, the CRJ-900, which was summarily dismissed since at least 2014 without explanation. And in fact, the commissioners were told this again 2018. Uh, and that's because consultants said it does not meet Aspen's operational requirements. And this seemed inconsistent with the published specs. It was a mystery to Bombardier. Mm -hmm. So we checked and found it has nothing to do with runway length or what the what was called in technical working group report required aircraft performance due to surrounding mountain terrain. Uh, only last Thursday, 16 October, in response to Chairman Child's astute question, did the county's consultants admit that actually this newer and somewhat larger version of the 700 can meet Aspen's operational requirements. The claim that it can't was based not on any technical unsuitability, but only on an assumption that the operators had an economic preference for the 700 due to the 900's possibly greater expected hot day weight restrictions, which mm -hmm. of course don't matter in our yeah. winter peak season. Yeah. But it, it just let me say one thing too. The Embraer is a great airplane. It has great economics. It's the performance side of the equation that doesn't really come up. It, it can get in here, but it, it doesn't get in here every day that the 700 can. If you're not making the flight, you're not making the revenue. Right, but none, none of us have proposed any of those planes. No, no, I, I'm just saying yeah. you'd mentioned before, but, isn't but an Embraer, thanks, and thanks, it, it's, a, it's a good airplane. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I think also this sort of comparison with the 900 would need restudy because, as we've heard, the regional jets valuably matched the reduced traffic needs, offering lower costs and greater fleet flexibility mm -hmm. on more routes. Mm -hmm. By the way, if the 700 conversely were to retire as claimed, 
then any economic preferability over the 900 would become irrelevant because you've cashed in the insurance policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and operators would not look at small marginal cost differences with a plane they're no longer flying. They would look at the value of serving versus not serving Aspen's lucrative market. Yeah, and, and might add there that with the more powerful engines, yeah. bigger load and all that, um, it doesn't give anything away performance-wise. It, mm -hmm. it equals mm -hmm. or better than. Yeah. Uh, so my point then is that the consultant's six-year misdescription of a notional economic disadvantage as if it were a flat technical prohibition misled FAA in the environmental assessment. It has misinformed every stage of the vision process. It has steered the technical working group into not considering this excellent, popular, widely available 900, of which Delta Connection ordered 20 just two years ago. And the last deliveries, by the way, the last 20, if production doesn't later restart now, the regional jet market is hot. Yeah. Uh, last 20 deliveries are scheduled for late this year. I, there's also even a further variant of 1,000, which I have not analyzed. Okay, second alternative is the Dash 8 Q400. Q stands for quiet, the turboprop. And it was excluded in three different ways. In the 2018 Aspen feasibility assessment, they excluded it because of their declining numbers in the North American market. That's irrelevant to an insurance option. And airlines that want to serve this market will have no trouble getting and flying this aircraft. It's still produced. And the analysis should, of course, focus on Aspen-specific needs, not national trends. It was excluded, secondly, by the technical working group comparison that ranked it one notch below the 700s based on a comparative table I've studied, and I cannot reproduce its logic or math in either of its versions. And then third, in the final report, they confined the discussion to jets only. And I think all three exclusions are invalid. This is a modern turboprop. It has active noise and vibration suppression that the old ones didn't. In fact, it's nearly as quiet inside as a jet. It's quieter outside by two of the three metrics, popular with pilots and customers, very cargo capable. Mm -hmm. It's more agile than the 700s, rated high it's altitude. So, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a first class machine, and it's going to find its way a niche too, for yeah. sure. 700's it's, got it. It'll be. Yeah. It's operationally superior for Aspen. It lands slower, oh. steeper descent option, probably better landing in bad weather, and it avoids the 700s hot day weight limits altogether. Now, last Thursday, 16 October, when Chairman Child finally recalled turboprops, the county's consultants called the Dash 8 Q400 a great airplane, very powerful, easily able to operate into Aspen. But they said, its favor has dramatically fallen in the U.S. because customers prefer jets and their smoother ride. Now, I don't think that's a valid argument for Aspen's very specific needs, especially if it's an insurance policy. It's easy to find there. Two years ago, there were over 500 in airline service, 56 on order. And I understand it's now in increased demand, have you heard Oh, that? yeah, it is for sure. I mean, uh, the economics are bringing back the turboprop, uh, and that's the simple truth of it. And I mean, it, it's, a, it's not a performance <coughs> issue or anything else. Are you can, interested, too? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. They're really my first go-to guys. They, they're the ones that really buy airplanes. Okay. In other words, there are transformed market conditions that are now making a hotter business case yep. for that plane. Well, uh, don't forget, it flew into Aspen for a while, too, and it did it very successfully. Ah, but that's the interesting point. So so we were told last Thursday that <clears throat> customers prefer jets to turboprops. Well, interesting, you know, Frontier and Republic's Aspen Denver service flew this very airplane, the, yeah. the Q400, for eight years, 2008 to 16. Yeah. It directly, successfully, I think, competed head-to-head -head against the 700, Bill Thompson expected it to cut airfare. So I'm not sure why we should believe that the same flyers who gladly flew that plane as recently as four years ago would reject it now. Do you have a view of that? Hmm. I think we're spending so much time on the 700. I think the market will satisfy the demand. One way or another. They will. Absolutely. They will, but either continue to remodel the 700, which they can do for a long time. Yeah or bring in other aircraft, but I think we don't need to really focus on one particular yeah. and it's company not up, or aircraft. Not up to us anyway. What we need to focus <laughs> on is the physical plant. Can the airport... And the training. And the training. Can the airport support these new airplanes? Yeah. And I think we're going to probably, I'm hoping, see quieter, 
faster, more efficient aircraft in the future. Mm -hmm. And but this airport then, I think, will be able to handle them a lot better than they have up to this point. And so. I, I dove down the, the kind of historical rabbit hole here just because <coughs> I wanted to make clear that not only six years ago, but right up to now, we're being we're hearing information that does not match market reality well, about yeah. about mean, the 700 you, you, or its alternatives, which we were told are zero. <clears throat> and there is a third one, and it doesn't last longer because it's the same airframe. It's a conversion of the interior. Sure. But the 500 is unusually well suited to estimates. More spacious, more modern, more luggage capacity, very yeah, warmly yeah, received right. by Much passengers right and owners. And it it's true. It was offered originally for scope compliance mainly, but now I guess it's got a strong business case too. Very much so. And one of the things I should we should add there is that it's being looked at at the engineering level right now to put the 900 engines on the 700. Which would, on, uh, on, on the 550? Maybe? On the 550 or the 700, on that airframe. Ah. So a, put more power on a smaller airframe. Well, uh, that has all kinds of ramifications oh, it, from performance. It's better safety and longer oh, range. Uh, well, not necessarily no. longer range. No. Oh, I, oh, but, yeah. but the safety factor, safety getting range. out of the, getting in and out of places, single engine performance, all those sorts of things are much enhanced. Interesting. And um, it, it's a, a going concern. As I say, if it wasn't for the change in ownership of the manufacturer, it might be down the road a little further. But definitely being looked at. Okay, so where does this get us on when to decide about airside reconfiguration? I think if it did take a decade to do that, and the 700s actually had zero replacement options instead of three, their retirement still doesn't need to drive a decision now uh, until probably well. the 2030s. And why? Well, it's reasonable to expect normal 700 and 550 life cycle extensions that can take us into the 2040s. And that would delay a decision into the 2030s, and waiting brings more clarity as the muddy waters settle. The 900 would offer an excellent successor, newer, longer range. It's also a backup to the 700. Probably unimportant economic differences compared to the value of serving the Aspen market, and greater value if larger planes do prove worthwhile, as we're told. And then the Asp even more Aspen suitable but shorter range, Mar market proven in Aspen Dash 8 Q400 provides ample further insurance against loss of service, and they're even considering a 50 seed variant. Yeah. Now that yeah. that segment yeah. gets yeah. hot, yeah. Yeah. and that's even more flexible. So I, I don't think anybody who understands this industry is credibly going to argue with any of what we're saying here. Uh, that is the fleet turnover and continued. ADG2 service, the level we have now, are no longer a reason to make big airside decisions now. Waiting yields better information, more and better options, fewer and more manageable risks, no material penalty. Meanwhile, there's a lot to do. The, yeah. the airport safety, the tower, the ground equipment, electrification, terminal improvements, ground transport can and should proceed promptly and adaptively. And that's a big, worthy agenda, widely accepted. But on the air side, as I wrote 17 August, time is our friend, haste is not. So bottom line, I think the 700s remain valid and valuable for upwards of two decades more, and they have three sound alternatives. So when you update those eight-year-old assumptions behind the current process to market realities today, there is no sound basis for potential fleet changes to drive prompt air side decisions. The probability that an unchanged air side would lose its our airline service for lack of planes is zero. But there is, I think, a pretty high likelihood that air side decisions made now would prove untimely and unwise due to three new realities that have not yet been properly considered. Rapid introduction of new, clean, quiet, and efficient planes, super efficient or electric or both, that were not assessed. Shifts to point-to-point -point route architectures that are mutually reinforcing with those new planes and major traffic forecasting errors and uncertainties. Now, it is true and it's good that potential successor jets, notably the attractive Bombardier design, by the way, Airbus A220, would be quieter and cleaner than the 700 precursor. But for many years to come, plausibly a decade, perhaps longer, airlines are going to be so financially weakened mm -hmm. that they have to run the planes they got longer safely extend their lives in standard ways, 
defer or avoid buying new planes. So let's not get way out over our skis designing for an airplane we won't get to choose, fit for market conditions that no longer exist, and whose return is slow and doubtful. That's at least what I'm seeing in the evidence. In fact, I think this decade's conditions and beyond strongly favor more flights in smaller planes on more convenient point-to-point -point routes. That is the very opposite of what the county is planning to build for. And meanwhile, the advent of super-efficient electric planes is going to shrink, even nearly erase, the environmental issues like carbon emissions, air pollution, and noise that now motivate airside reconfiguration. Uh, <clears throat> now, I think when the Community Character Working Group unanimously recommended that it would not be right to proceed with airside development for the foreseeable future until and unless we have a better understanding of what a much larger airport will mean for the character of the community. That was 27 December 19. I agree with that, but I think they understated the case but for, for two reasons. And the first is the serious mismatch between the vision process's stated purpose of helping prioritize any airport improvement and investment for the next 30 years and the reliance on incremental mechanistic extrapolation from data several years old. And, you know, it's claimed to reflect future aviation technology, but I don't see any described in the technical work groups, working group three, or anywhere else. I don't see any serious consideration of future aviation technologies like I briefed last November in a public forum. I only see what's on today's market. So that's a failure, I think, of foresight and strategic purpose that risks investing $239 million in airside changes that may well prove misconceived, unfit for purpose. The technologies are moving so fast that electric airplanes, driven not just by climate goals but of strong business case, are now expected to provide most or all domestic flights in two mountainous countries with tough weather, Norway and Scotland, by 2025. That's before the airside project we're talking about could be built. Now, it is likely that efficient, longer, efficient and electric long-haul planes will have longer wings. That is not necessarily true of short and medium-haul designs. I'll give you an example that I mentioned uh, last August 31st. One of over 100 aviation startups called Auto Aviation out of the military uh, community hopes by 2025 to be selling the eight-fold more efficient Calera 500L business plane. They revealed it August 26th this year after 31 flight tests. It's an air taxi. It has six luxury seats. They've already designed a double-sized version with probably 20-odd ordinary seats. The range is 4,500 4, nautical miles. That will connect almost any two cities in the United States nonstop. <coughs> And the operating cost, they say, plausibly, is one-sixth that of today's business jets. So it should disrupt and transform business models in general aviation and in airlines, and it will help the point-to-point -point routes, mm -hmm. you know, can you, imagining flights to dozens of cities from Aspen direct, beating the hub-and-spoke route architectures. So by the time Aspen spends a half billion dollars rebuilding its airport around bigger jets, for hub-and-spoke airlines, plus GA, both the planes and the route architecture, which is built to exploit the hub slot monopolies, may well look obsolete. By the way, that plane uses a single pusher prop with a quiet double V6 piston engine way aft, but its eight-fold greater efficiency should ideally suit it to going electric early. Its bulbous fuselage, lightweight and rather short wings, should nicely fit Aspen's existing restrictions, because uh, the 8x efficiency doesn't come from longer wings, it comes from laminar flow aerodynamics. There are a lot of other capable firms backed by powerful investors and partners in hot pursuit of super efficient and electric flight that's radically cleaner, radically quieter, and it's rushing right at us. It's likely to disrupt aviation well before these improvements could be built, let alone repaid. And all this has been ignored so far. I mentioned these examples just to illustrate that sound strategy for the intended 30 years and beyond needs serious study of the radical changes now emerging in aviation. 
not driving full speed ahead while looking in the rearview mirror. This failure, as I see it, of imagination and analysis makes it likely that what the county seems about to build will be the wrong thing, the wrong size. And you don't need to believe me, the Financial Times wrote 12 September that the aviation industry is, I quote, on the brink of the biggest revolution since the 1930s. That's when jets were developed. And they're referring to electric flight and it's, of course, enabled by super efficiency as well. So a sound strategy will examine and exploit this revolution and not plan for past trends. For airports of the size and market reach of Aspen, longer wingspan, hence greater runway width and separation, may or may not be relevant. We'll have to see. Not by doing it, but by thinking about it first. Smaller planes in point-to-point -point routes are likely to beat bigger ones in hub and spoke. And I see no evidence that the vision process, the county, or its consultants have analyzed these issues correctly or at all. And there's one other thing that's been overlooked, sort of mentioned, but it hasn't affected anything I can see. Aviation's transformation by the pandemic. The upending of aviation is not a passing squall followed by pretty rainbows. It's a Richter 9. It has shaken aviation to its foundations, probably more than any other industry. The profound disruptions to aviation cannot be modeled with normal tools, but clearly there's a bloodbath underway. IATA, 29 September, forecasts two-thirds less global air travel for this full year. They say the world's airlines are losing $13 billion a month, risking bankruptcy within months for many. That's $300,000 a minute, it's $5,000 a second. It's a big deal. The airlines, the airframe makers, are in big trouble. U.S. air traffic slumps of 19% after 9-11 and 11% after the odd 8 financial crash, those are dwarfed by two-thirds slump this year. United's third quarter revenues are 78 below last year's third quarter for a $1.8 billion quarterly loss. United doesn't expect real recovery to start until 2022, even to start. The industry now expects recovery to take many years to a decade and agrees that some travel will never return as more people choose to travel less, video conference more, shift from jet setting to Zoom sitting. The CEO of Southwest said last month business travel might not fully return for a decade. Liam News forecast uh, that traffic could return to 2019 levels in 2028. So much for the growth forecast. Leisure travel may or may not improve, prove more robust because some folks indeed flee to rural recreation and hideaways, but some other folks worry about infection en route or afterwards. So the sudden stagnation of aviation, through, although it's a nightmare for the industry, is a wonderful gift, the gift in the arms of the, of the problem for Aspen because it gives us precious time for learning, reflection, and prudent, adaptable, far-sighted choices. Now, if you think that or reply that collapsing demand for global and national commercial carriers simply doesn't apply to Aspen's booming general aviation that we saw in the first slides, well, yeah, but I would reply, indeed, Aspen's conditions are very unusual. So why are your analysis and proposed solution for Aspen virtually all about commercial carriers that are only now 10 percent or normally 25 of our operations? And you're now shifting your case to general aviation, on which we have poor data and little analysis. The pandemic's increased private flights into Aspen do not even reveal a problem that airside reconfiguration and becoming a full class three airport could really solve, arguably the opposite. So let me conclude by suggesting that there are five reasons to pause big airside decisions because the vision process is hard work and dedication have, I fear, been overtaken by events. So I would suggest the commissioners pause for five reasons, and let's look at slide eight. First, to examine whether the twin risks of continuing to tolerate the dangerously deficient training and preparation of some general aviation pilots and the risk of letting in unsuitable aircraft can be avoided. By restructuring the FAA relationship to regain county non-safety control within a strong and creative partnership with FAA. Second, to let the dust settle <clears throat> from the greatest shock in aviation's history, 
with profound and opaque long-run results. We don't know what's going to emerge from the rubble or when. That adds risk to big long-term investments. Third, to do the aviation foresight that the technical working group wasn't asked or equipped to do, and apparently the consultants didn't do either, so that tech and strategic transformations can inform airside choices and their timing and their risk management. Fourth, to get the technical and economic facts right about fleet evolution, its options and risks, <clears throat> FAA's attitude, so we can inform the right choices made at the right time and not sooner. And fifth, to redesign, plan, measure, not model, analyze, publish, discuss, and set targets from <coughs> the baseline noise and emissions data and set standards coming out of that that the community character group unanimously and emphatically wanted before airside decisions are made, data that are apparently are still not available. There is one more ticking clock factor here that's evidently in the commissioner's mind. That's the 2018 environmental assessment that's valid for three years. As I understand it, the good faith substantial action, including design, uh, would suffice to keep it active even if FAA doesn't require, as it may, a new assessment because of the changed choice of airside configuration. Such FAA acceptance of due diligence seems especially plausible if the county's early actions focus not just on the terminal but also on major safety upgrades, Notab notably tower equipment and probably height. There, there's a funny remark by an FAA rep in the Vail Daily, 15 July 2010. Uh, I have not looked further into this, but the FAA rep suggested the tower height might need to be roughly tripled to be able to see the ends of the runway. <laughs> so now they do that with closed circuit TV, which uh, I think in bad weather is not as helpful as the online independence pass webcams. But I wonder if triple tower height might enable FAA's controllers to see over buttermilk as they should. In fact, Tom once wondered if the tower, which nowadays needn't be at the airport, could even go on buttermilk. And by the way, if it needs more height than the county limits allow, let's make an exception for safety. There's nothing more important. So while pausing the big airside decisions, I think the county could certainly proceed with other major agendas. The safety, the tower, the terminal, ground electrification, transport integration. Mindful of the unprecedented, unforecastable changes underway in aviation, so be cautious about capacity projections and careful to preserve and expand optionality as that unknowable future unfolds. Resetting the FAA relationship with expert and respected rec representation governance improvements under an expert airport board, probably county ownership of the F FBO when their contract comes up for renewal shortly. That, those things form an essential non-construction agenda in parallel. So that's a lot to do, not sit idle. I want to thank all our audience so far for your kind and patient attention and now warmly welcome Tom, and then Dick, and ask to correct any mistakes I've made and to explain further the points you think are most important to add to the public conversation. And I want to start, I'll serve as a moderator here, with whether and how the county could get, regain control of non-safety choices at our airport. So, Tom, I understand you've actually done some of those. Yeah, I, well, and uh, they're there for the, the looking, or you can go peek over the fence, or you can go in and talk to the airport manager and, and do it, but there's, there's sophistication in both the cockpit and the ground equipment these days in aviation, and it moves very quickly, so it's going to continue to, to go that way, but there are ground uh, guidance systems now that are not terribly expensive. GPS is backing a lot of it, and we all know how accurate GPS can be. So I, th I think there are things that should be looked at. Noise is another factor that here could be addressed here with deflectors, which also have an impact on um, the um, environment and other pollution that might be floating around. Um, there's things as simple as not having APUs running to get the airplane warmed up and that sort of thing. There's those whiny turbines in the back. Yeah, the yeah, it's a barely another jet engine, mm -hmm. and it just sits there and whines and stinks and uh, pollutes. 
Whereas, you know, there's electric ones that you can pull up to the aircraft, plug in, and they'll be just as efficient with all the tasks that are being done there, including heating, including flight planning yeah. and following, all that sort of thing. It's like so shore power. What about the taking seaport. electric tugs and pulling the aircraft to a different position and having them right up against the uh, terminal? And uh, even to the end of the runway and building a spot toward the end of the runway for run-ups and start-ups and all that sort of thing. It's done elsewhere. It's nothing that I have talked to you about and many others, including the Vision Group, has anything to do with something that's off the wall new. It's not like an electric airplane where there's a lot of unknowns. This is stuff that's being used elsewhere today, and we can go talk to the management there. Sure. So that's that's the parallel agenda. But how would you how would you th speak from your experience about uh, regaining local control of the non-safety issues. Then we can get oh, on the, on the uh, yeah. privatization issue. Well, it's it's not an overnight event, that's for sure. Um, and there is some homework that has to be done locally to make sure you have the right folks on board to make those kinds of decisions. But the benefit of that uh, privatization or taking ownership mm -hmm. of the non-safety <clears throat> issues, as you articulate. But not of the airport, which okay. remains public. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a way of going about that. Some have done it very effectively. The folks in Innsbruck did a fabulous job, and everybody knew what was going on in some considerable detail, had had a chance to participate, were given a ground, a, 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 an initial plan from which to make their comments. It wasn't, let's do something with the airport, and here's the airport now. It was, this is the sort of things we would like to consider, and we would like your input in it. And they got a fabulous response. So that's to it. a process and governance model. It is. It and, is. And similarly, I noticed John Wayne Airport, under the Orange County Board of Supervisors, has a professionally I, expert governing board of the airport. Oh, that is essential. There's not one I've been involved in yet that's done it successfully, internationally or domestically, that didn't have that as the core thing. Yeah. And, Some, and that would also have the advantage that the that our. Uh, rather overstretched generalist county commissioners wouldn't have to try to be aviation experts. I, I, it's impossible to do it at the level that that needs, that our airport needs. You yeah. can't do it. So this would also presumably make us more credible with FAA and, be, and able to execute. Let me say that the Aspen Airport is very much on the FAA radar. It's for us to exploit. They want a good plan to be presented to them, and they'll, they'll spend a lot of time with us. They're looking for a complex airport, operationally, I mean, with all the stuff we have around here, to help their program of privatization get further airborne, as it were. It's been a long grind for them. They haven't reached the uh, goals they wanted to, but this would be the perfect, because it's not a flat, long runway at sea level and all the other things that would make it easy. And this is a, have rocks in them. This yeah. is a, exactly. Yeah. So it, I think we have an excellent opportunity, um, you know, mainly, main, mending a few wounds along the way. But I think the FAA would very much like to see the whole exercise around Aspen built up a little bit more, be more consistent with reality and, and things like that. And as you've just articulated, we need to look into the future. We can't just say... We're looking at jets that, are, as we currently know them, and that's what there's, we just need a bigger one or a quieter one or a cleaner one or whatever. That's not going to wash. They're way ahead of the curve and are very aware of what's going on, as you and I are. I mean, I must have filled your mailbox ten times by now with all the stuff I'm sending on the electric. It's, it is the biggest, well, most well-funded exercise in aviation I've ever seen. And, uh, the the electric revolution. Yeah, absolutely, it is huge. With and with all the big players involved, everybody. Rolls from, Royce, Rolls General Royce, Electric, Boeing, Airbus, Boeing. They're all in it. Airbus and is the deep guy in who it. wins is going to be the, the guy who controls it. Well, and and then when you look at the potential, I mean, just to have proven an eight x more efficient, six x cheaper to run uh, plane that is ideal for point to point. Yeah. You know, imagine a 20-odd seat airplane at a sixth the operating cost yeah. going anywhere in the U.S. And the other thing that we need to hammer up with the, uh, the passenger is the fact that he doesn't have to go from A to C to get to B. And act as self-sorting cargo at C. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then they this lose is your the luggage. way it used to be <laughs> and the way it's going to go back to because the economics of it make such good sense. And, you know, the, the, the faster that 
it can be understood, the quicker it'll be implemented in planning. But that implies a world of more commercial flights uh, that are smaller planes, like what we have now or less. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's inevitable. I, I, as you said, the, the industry, when it's honest with itself, doesn't see this turning over in the near term at all. I mean, I, there's going to be portions of it they'll never use again. Uh, the 380, uh, for other reasons as well, well, is a huge billion dollar deal that's dead on arrival. Yeah. Because, and they knew this before they actually built the aircraft. And mm -hmm. we could be making the mistake here. You know, uh, we don't want to do it again. Uh, you know, they've showed us how not to no. do it. Well, we're doing a bit of that when we're making plans using old information, old scenarios, uh, poor forecasts to be sure. Um, a lot of that's got to be repaired and, and rejiggered. And, re and, and it's good to hear from your experience with FAA that they would like to do something really good and, and potentially quite innovative here. I notice, uh, I think you told me that in September they made a $380,000 grant to Aspen Airport. That, I, for, I got that out of FAA material. I didn't for better told lighting. Me I don't think it's been uh, yeah. known here. No, but uh, uh, no, that, that was it, in it fact. It, that there were, they care about our safety. The way that this was a list of cities or airports rather around the U.S. by state as to what had been allocated for the year. Hmm. And the $380,000 lighting system didn't go into any detail, just said lighting system was allocated to Aspen. And uh, I don't know what the status is of it. But, but let, me, let me go back a minute to John Wayne, because I think you were involved in that one mm -hmm. in L.A. Yeah. Because they are uh, prohibiting some noisy aircraft types. They are charging for noise and pollution mm -hmm. uh, violations of their right. standards, and FAA stands hitched for all that. So if they can do it in public ownership, why can't we do it in public ownership? I can't imagine why there'd be any reason. I mean, the FAA are very pleased with that pro program down there. And so is uh, John Wayne. And it's one of the highest rated airports in the country in customer yeah. satisfaction yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's operations. Clean. Yeah. It's, it, it, there's electric carts all over the place there and everything else. But the, um, the, the thing about John Wayne is it was the leader in introducing some of the ways of testing and the results. That they set the, the level at which the FAA says that that's the minimum you can have. And we could be that too. The FAA is looking for a partner in this privatization idea. And we could be that front and center. And the other thing, as I've said to you before, if we make this the greenest airport in the world, people will flock here because the technology will be here. It'll be, they could touch it, feel it, talk to it. And the policy will be here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge opportunity. And one can also here. imagine this being a showcase uh, in a new administration that might have different environmental priorities. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there's a, there's so many. The timing isn't that wrong if we can get our arms around it and rethink what we're doing today, and then you know, as I say, use what we've learned. But let's go the other, go the distance. Before we, before we leave the uh, regaining public control of non-safety issues, I want to just touch briefly on something the lawyers told the commissioners last Thursday, 16 October. They did give examples of very protracted, expensive, and in one case failed attempts at private ownership, the, yeah. the other kind of privatization yeah. that we are not suggesting. Yeah. And they gave an example, say, San Juan in Puerto, San Juan, Puerto Rico. It, it's, it's the really the all-star performer right now. Yeah, San Juan has done it the way the uh, folks last week were discussing in that it, they made it a, a private airport and they, they run it. Partly for yeah, their own yeah, financial yeah, reasons. Yeah. But, but I think the commissioners were, were quite put off to hear it cost $16 million. Yeah, it, yeah I, I, well, and you and I have talked about this before. It cost $16 million, but it didn't cost Puerto Rico $16 million. But wasn't that like 14 or so to renovate the airport? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a, a very relative the whole, the airport renovation, 
Uh, it was pretty run down. Yeah, it was, it was a disaster area. And yeah, a lot of the monies that went in on that $60 million were to that, to upgrading uh, um, air, aviation, uh, nautical uh, radars. Okay, so, and, uh, so it, the conversion to, of, of pr to private, private ownership, yeah. that process as opposed to the physical renovation of yeah. the airport cost, what, a couple of million or? Uh, about that, yeah, it was a little over a couple million to my recollection. Now, I okay. wasn't involved to the degree I know. Yeah, I think if the that. commissioners knew that, they might feel a little differently. Oh yeah, but of course but it's, it's a not, whole different. Program. But it's not. It's not what we're discussing, and I think we agree that that the sort of regaining public control of non-safety issues is not a trivial exercise. It will have time and costs, but it would also resolve many of the if not all many if not all of the big issues yeah. that are now plaguing the commissioners mm -hmm. I think that's true I, I think there it covers a lot and what isn't covered <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with bringing up and seeing if it can be covered sort of thing so uh, I think um, the opportunity is now and if they're so inclined the commissioners come to a conclusion that yeah let's step back and, and start investigating some of these things the first thing to investigate is go to the FAA and say, this is what we're thinking about now. Right on. We, we, yeah, wanna, can you do for us what you did for John Wayne? Yeah, well, I, yes, that, that's right. And, and a, a little broader agenda. It just, it, it's interesting, just on bringing up the John Wayne thing again, too, is that the noise restrictions that John Wayne put in were advised to other airports ah. and have a domino effect. So it's just not unique what's going on there. The FAA or somebody that the FAA knows is going about the business of making sure all airports are knowing that the uh, whatever airplane it is is dirty, is noisy, is blah blah blah, and then the, the so if you're if you're too noisy, you're not allowed to land, and if you violate that and land, uh, well unless it's an emergency, in, right? A juice except or something. except yeah, emergency, yeah. you're in deep trouble. Yeah, and if you if you are allowed to land but you're too noisy because you're not following the right procedures, yeah. uh, then there's a, a an interesting a statistic. Fine. When I talked to the, the John Wayne guy to prepare for what we were doing, um, he said we've had only one guy come back and try us twice. That's amazing. So <laughs> there's a learning curve. Yeah, but it's quick learning curve. Are these obviously the fines are substantial enough to make them think twice about it. So it's a big ticket. And it's not a, it's not a, a secret either. I mean, the people have talked about it. So when you go to John Wayne, you make sure your chariot is going to you know, duck all their problems, all well, the issues there. And there we could also limits. do what, say, Zurich Air Airport in Switzerland pioneered, uh, and that is the landing fee can be positive or negative depending on how clean and quiet you are. Mm, that's a, an excellent deal. But fees that's can, a fees can pay for rebates, and that incentivizes both ends of the push me pull you you're trying to do. To that could be <coughs> expanded into a lot of aspects. A lot of aspects. It doesn't need to just stick to the critical ones. But yeah, it's a good idea, and it works. It, they, the problem with that, I've heard from the guys at Innsbruck, is that um, it has to be managed. There's really a, some administration to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be fair to everybody, that. that um, but it works, there's no doubt about that. And it, it seems to me that if, if our airport had a, uh, an expert governing board th that its complexity really <laughs> merits, uh, we would also probably have better ideas, more transparency. You know, you wouldn't have stuff like that roughly 1,300 gallon fuel spill a couple mm. of years ago by mm. the yeah. FBO employees carelessness that yeah. that, that's a that's, that's a serious big, stuff that's, yeah. that cannot be pushed under the government. and it was not reported at the time to 911 the fire chief the sheriff or environmental health yeah and it nobody would have known about it if the Aspen Times hadn't found out and, and no. run a story uh, th so I think in a you know, in a transparently run, publicly owned operation, yeah. that kind of thing wouldn't happen anymore. It, well, it may happen, but it'd be it'd be responded to in a completely well, different it, way from what we've read or heard. Yeah, yeah there'd absolutely. be accountability. Oh, and, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, uh, and you've been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, some comments and Please. on the FAA, and and want to start off by thanking you for all of the tremendous research you've done. Okay. historically and your own thoughts and comments 
and to be able to have Tom here with his incredible expertise around the world, we're benefiting from that. There's no question about that. We're all happy And I'm to help. hoping, because <laughs> the way I wrote that letter in the paper a while back, that uh, the commissioners will use the word pause again, because we have a lot to look at. We've done a good job with the uh, vision committee. It was very, very well run and organized and everything. Uh, and it just basically opened up six more doors. And now it's time to look ahead. And meanwhile, everything shifted under our feet. Yeah, everything shifted. Yep. But when you stop and look at it, let me go back and, and make the statement that we have a very unique little airport. One-way strip, basically, down on the bottom of a valley. There's no room for a crosswind uh, runway. There's no room for a lot of things. And we're also seeing the population grow near and around the runway. Uh, some of the projects that are being talked about just across the street might be yeah, yeah. might be in trouble with the noise and the sound and the pollution Take and everything else. Take your plates well taken there because the FAA is watching. Yeah, they have well, to watch are, that. Are they concerned about the uh, proposal to put housing at the lumber yard? Because I, I thought the county had promised not to do that. Well, they're talking about it, and if it happens, if you look at the pictures in the paper, and some of the size of those buildings are three and four stories Ooh. high. <laughs> now, there is a plane that comes off of the runway at an angle like this, and nothing is allowed to grow under that. Yeah, I learned that when I was the airport it's manager in Aspen, you know, back in the 80s. The, uh, the FAA told me once that one of the jobs you have to do is to cut down all those trees at the end of the runway. They violate this. I took a look at it and I did some drawing and I drew a line and then photographed it and realized that yes, part of those trees were sticking up above that. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the FAA and I said, can we just cut the trees off so that they're below the line? And they went, good idea. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> what that did for me though, yeah was it made me realize, and your comments are so true on this regard, that the FAA are very, very reasonable. Mm -hmm. They're good people. Yeah. And we know more about our airport, quite frankly, than they do because of staff changes and everything. We've been living it. Now, uh, and I've seen this. Uh, when I was the airport manager over in Telluride, I got some, some waivers from the FAA that uh, were really strong, you have to do it this way. And I came back with them with some very logical answers and saying, yeah, I agree, but because of, we can't do that right now, but could we start doing it? And they said, as long as you can do it within 10 years. So we started and they're still doing it mm -hmm. in, in yeah. Telluride. So they're reasonable. So they're reasonable. Sure. And they said, yeah, yeah, we understand, we see that. So when I hear people say that the FAA demands that, I always back off a little bit and say yeah. they don't demand, they suggest, yeah. and it's in their rules and everything. And and if we like have an issue yeah. that, because of our very unique airport, can be modified, for, especially from a safety point of view, I think you'll see that they're going to go along with it. And it, it depends, like any relationship, I suppose, on... Do they trust you? Do they think you really know what you're doing? Sure, exactly. Oh, to be sure, yeah. No question about that. Yeah, and, and indeed, the the, the uh, firm that, of a legal firm that I was advising the commissioners last week uh, does a lot of that kind of work. I don't know if you yeah. want to call it lobbying or what, but representation of somebody's interests <clears throat> to the agency. Well, I've always looked at these uh, requests to the FAA from a safety point of view because I've flown a lot over the last 50 years now, um, <laughs> with the chance of having accidents many times and luckily having the courage to say, you know what, I think I'm going to go land at Grand Junction yeah. and spend the night or drive up. And I can Postponement focus... Postponement beats a cancellation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can focus that story into so many mountain rescue stories that I would bore you silly, but there's a lot of dead people who 
had to get into Aspen because the daughter's wedding party was tonight. Yeah, and that 28-year-old pilot you talked about. And, well, and we the, took five the, of those people off the side of Mount Sopras. Right. And they the, never got to go to the party. And Yep, and the yeah. CEO says, I got to be at my oh, yeah. board meeting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There's another one who's, who was killed. The CEO was killed in the plane crash. His family survived, and his daughter is uh, has moved to Aspen because she loved the community and everything. Mm. And I won't go into details of what she's done, but she's done a tremendous service to Picking County. I'll leave it at that for right now. But That's awesome. Um, safety is always my number one issue. When I hear of something or think of something, it's, okay, well, how does that affect safety at this particular airport that we know and we use? So you've talked very compellingly about pilot training the what's in the head and uh, reflexes <clears throat> aspect of safety. And Tom has mentioned uh, some of the hardware. We've already mentioned lighting, mm -hmm. uh, tower height. How do, you, how do you both feel about the mo modernity of the equipment, the various radars and <laughs> stuff in the tower? I've got a, a, a good example of that. The equipment is incredible. It's growing so fast, and it's you so... in the market or in Aspen? Everywhere. In it's Aspen, available. In our tower? No, yeah. I'm thinking of aircraft equipment oh, yeah. itself. Yeah. It's growing so fast that it's, yeah, it's remarkable. This technology... <laughs> yeah. Plus 20. <laughs> yeah. Well, a good example was a plane that crashed here in Aspen this last summer. Um, the man uh, punched into his GPS the next airport. It was Eagle, okay? And the machine said, after takeoff, turn right to a heading of so-and-so and go 42 miles or whatever it was. Okay. He took off and hit autopilot, and the plane turned and started going to Eagle. Then he looked out the window, and he saw nothing but mountains everywhere. The, the machine didn't tell him to maybe circle and climb and then go to Eagle, or maybe go to Carbondale, which we all do, and turn right and go to Eagle. Yeah, yeah. No, it just said, want to go to Eagle? Mm, straight right. line. We've all had that GPS luckily, experience in our cars. Luckily, he was in <laughs> yeah. a very modern airplane that had a parachute. When he realized he was in deep trouble, he reached up and pulled a cord. Parachute popped up. The plane stopped flying yeah. and came down into the trees and landed. Sort they got out. They're alive today. So yeah. I think it's a good example of, of what safety can do. But again, I focus that back. It's not on the machine. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. It's up but, here. But, but let, me, let me then ask you, there's incredible good technology, not like the way that one was used, uh, <clears throat> for stuff we can have in the tower and on the ground and radars looking around to both to keep everybody safe. How much are we using that? How modern is the equipment in our tower, for example? Well, I, I've been up the tower a couple of times. I'm sure you've been I up know, a lot I'm more than that. Lately, no, I no, not lately. No, not lately, but mine's lately. And um, it, it's, it's effective. It's doing the task it's there for. But there is a lot more updated equipment, and the guys in the tower know all of what's needed, they, you know, they're not uh, sitting there blind, that's for sure. And it just, somebody needs to go in and just give it a dusting and say, what can we do better in this? What, may, what can we make you offer a, more, a safer service with? Would Weather it? collection and that sort of thing is, is, a, is an issue. Um, certainly radar uh, could be handled differently, but uh, if we could get some um, synergies between new equipment there, new equipment in the tower, we may get lower limits here. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong. Oh. One of that thing you referred to earlier in my experience, uh, the RNAV and the MLS. I mean, after my experience the other day, I'm not sure it's needed, but the fact is it's available. You can curve the localizer, which is the, uh, the, the center line indication, oh. and you can step the glide slope, which is the glide slope that So if you're coming standard. in the other way, although you don't have to step it down, 
there's a little bit of curve. Just a tiny bit. I mean, 3% is nothing. And yep. when, when you're out, so you, way out, you, it's you, a bit more. You can more, do all the maneuvers required automatically. Yeah. 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 Power, the the uh, um, autopilot can handle this easily, easily, as they do coming in the other way. Yeah. Uh, um. And uh, are, there, are there other things? I, I mean, I assume there are a lot of folks that would be happy to sell you stuff and presumably would make surveys and offers for free as yeah. part of their sales cycle. Oh. And that's a way of learning what's available. Absolutely. What's it worth to us? The, the opportunity for manufacturers of avionics equipment, that sort of thing, knowing the reputation of Aspen, they'd give their eye teeth to get in here and make a recommendation. Yeah. And, uh, it's needed. It, it is it's needed. needed. It, no doubt. I helped uh, comment on the very first instrument approach in here. <laughs> Back when I was the manager, we uh, we widened the runway, and during my watch, from seventy-five feet to hundred. Big deal. <laughs> and I said uh, to the FAA, I said uh, we'd like to have runway lights too, <laughs> but you have a curfew. You don't allow night landing. And I said, I know. But coming in here in marginal conditions, we need to, to yeah. say all we can to show people where this airport is. Yeah. And that it's not 82. And, and I, I got runway headlights. lights in because we asked for it. Another FAA yeah. comment yeah. there. Yeah. And my thoughts now on the runway is not to design it for a particular aircraft. Does it need widening? I think it does. Mm -hmm. It should be to some degree. Should I say how much? No, because I don't know. There's airport engineers that know a lot more than I do about it. But should it be widened a little bit? Maybe not a lot, but some? Yes. Should the taxiway be moved? I don't think it's necessary. And I think if we were to talk to the FA about that, they would say, yeah, but if two 737s, one's going to take off and one's taxiing, that's illegal. Well, maybe you put a turnout at a certain mm -hmm. point, hold the one taxing, let them go. Well, there's it, a lot of and, and indeed, tricks like that. that. Well, it can be done. he knows more problems, about it than actually. I. Everybody who flies uh, com commercially knows that, you know, if you listen to the, the squawk, uh, you know, you're fly two, three, four heavy. Well, you could be fly two, three, four wide. Yeah. And, and if there's a, something... Well, the tower something, would be the first to know yeah. that there's yeah. a potential conflict. They just gatehold the guy for 10 minutes while the other guy gets... And in exactly. Fact, in fact, there have been well, wide aircraft oh, coming sure. in here. My sure. comments, I don't know if they're procedure. closing comments or not, but we do need work. The terminal is way overbuilt. I helped build it as a contractor <laughs> before it was even built, dating myself here. Um but it needs help. I've done the tour with the Vision yeah. Group, and I'm like, God, you guys have put up with a lot here, you know? It and needs. I, I gather it's really hard oh, it's on a lot of the. It employees. is. It it's needs. It needs work right now. Yep. And I don't want to probably remodel it until I know that's where it's going to go, but I think that decision could be made fairly quickly. Um, there's always the safety issues, whether they're communications or mechanical or whatever, and. Um, then there's the runway that needs to be strengthened a little bit, hasn't been touched for a long time, yeah. and widened. Yeah. Um, I dealt with the Telluride Airport where we had a dip in the middle of it, <laughs> 78 feet lower in the middle. <laughs> isn't like that anymore, I can tell you. I got it changed. Yeah, I bet you did, because we've done a lot of testing. The hot and high of a lot of the manufacturers <laughs> has I've, done it, Telluride. Yeah. And I've been in and out there. So it's doable, and I don't think that that uh, I think the message, at least coming from me to the commissioners, is let's not jump in immediately. Let's continue to look like you're doing yeah. here. Yeah. And the answers will only get better and safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I too, have no <clears throat> conclusions, preconceptions, assumptions about what ought to happen on the air side. I'm focusing here on when we decide on the basis of what information yeah. from a wider set of sources and perspectives, Factual, yeah. asking a different set of questions in a different order, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and probably starting with, can we actually get out from under the non-discrimination clause mm -hmm. uh, and 
as get it, the kind as, of local control John Wayne does so we can yeah. get the community oh. outcomes that I've we I've talked want. to the John Wayne uh, uh, managers over there who knew Tom, by the way, yeah. and I asked him about the, quote, private ownership, and he said, well, it's not really private. You know, John Doan's wife don't own the airport. No, it's not ownership. It's a county facility. Uh, exactly. And he said it's working so well yeah. that that's something that we as a vision committee didn't look at. Yeah. We don't know. I don't know about that. So. But that's nobody's fault, in my opinion. It's just a question of not having the right folks around the table exactly. to share that kind of exactly. information. I mean, I, I've, I've worked a few of these uh, and I've never had one before that didn't have a leader that was steeped in aviation. Mm -hmm. Maybe not from that airport either. Mm -hmm. you know? Always good to talk to other people that are in the aircraft airport development because there's always new ideas, sure. just like their new avionics in the front of the airplane. <clears throat> and how many people heard the fact that ATC system changed all over the place like this sure. year, past year? Oh, yeah. Totally different, much safer, much more control. dependent on the... Uh, pilot now mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's great it's great I mean you uh, th things are evolving that I don't think so, that it was part of the dialogue and okay. we need to make it part of the dialogue yeah. Tom I, I want to clarify one small point but I think it might have startled some people when I said it earlier and it's something I, I learned from you um, I have not made any assumptions about what mandate was given to the county's consultants mm -hmm. in this process. But I, I, I did say here uh, what it looked like. What it looked like, yeah. and, and not just to the participants, but to the consultants themselves. And what, what was your insight into that? Well, I tried to make a, a point whenever I was at one of the vision meetings and there were consultants there to talk to them a little bit uh, afterwards. In fact, that's how I met Judy before I met you because I was talking to her because I went that's, by that's and she wife. was making some in, uh, comments. I thought, that lady knows what she's talking about. So I sat and talked to her and then she introduced me to, to you later. And I talked to a lot of people there. I made it a point to and I met Tim Mooney that way and others that I, have been very useful contacts. And um, I, I think that you've got to have some kind of expertise that's going to guide it, not make the decisions, but at least make the decision make makers aware of what the circumstance is. And um, so I think, um, you know, I, I think we've said just about everything we can say with regard to, uh, do you need more clarification on that well, point? Well, just that I, I gather that uh, you were meeting on another matter with a major consultant to the county on this oh, topic. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I did do that, yeah. Um, it, it was made clear to me in absolute, not carry the ball forward, so there's no names going to be involved in this, that the guidance that they had been given to be involved here was to make the airport larger so they could accommodate larger aircraft and specifically the one that was told to me was the 650. So there's no doubt that there was some interest in the, the expansion of the airport for a specific application. But I don't think that's certainly um, a relevant comment, but I'm not so sure that that was successfully addressed in, in uh, the process. And I don't think, as you say, if, if bigger airplanes are the ones that are to come in here, certainly the runway and probably the taxiway to some extent need some work. But let's make sure that what we're doing is the 30 days, 30 year mandate is fully exploited that was given to the vision group, 30 years. I don't see much in what's evolved out of that organization that goes really past five years. You can stretch it to 10 on some minor issues and certainly the, the uh, situation with regard to the tower and the airport, uh, the terminal and all that, which the FAA is only interested in safety anyway, so they're not critical to that anyway. But uh, absolutely there, there are things that can be addressed right now um, and there's a, there's a, everything that we've talked about here. There's equipment to fulfill the mission now. Yep. It's not we're not inventing. Let's get anything. it addressed and let's yep. get started. You bet. <clears throat> I couldn't agree with you more. Good. Well, I'm so grateful to both of you uh, and to all others who have contributed oh, to be sure <laughs> to this. Uh, and uh, I, I will. Uh, 
<coughs> make sure that, that the community is well informed and the commissioners are informed that we have had this conversation yeah. so people can watch a broadcast or stream it. Uh, and I will also uh, provide a copy of my remarks as a written comment to the commissioners. I'll send it to the newspapers as well. Uh, so uh, I think this has been a very valuable uh, new set of information that I, I hope the community will Same issue, find new useful. eyes. It's always good to have some new eyes looking at yes. anything that's being considered. And I think that's all we're contributing here is saying, hey, this is, a, this is a big task, it's an important task, it's got the welfare of the community all the way down the valley, really. It's not just Aspen, yep. it's no mess. So let's and make... Let's do it properly and thoroughly and then move forward in a chronological order that makes sense to achieve what the goals are. And, of course. We, and make, make the right choices at yep. the right time when we have the right Precisely. information. Just on that Rumble. score, um, we on the ones I've been involved with, we've always mapped it out exactly that way. This has to happen so that we know what to do with this, we do this, the timeline follows along the bottom, you've all seen these, these charts, and first thing you know, you've got exactly what you need from the start of the desire to the execution of the build. Until the earthquake, and then uh. when all your assumptions <laughs> turned into scrambled eggs, no, no, you uh, make earthquake then, you got, then you got to look at that Gantt chart again and say, well, wait a minute, well. this thing we assumed isn't right anymore, and that isn't going to happen, and this will happen instead. And we've got to rethink sort of like the, aviation forecasts. some of the logic we went into. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. know what you're saying. And, yep. and not, not make a big premature commitment, yeah. but get on with the stuff we do know enough about Absolutely. to right. do right now. And learn some lessons And safety first. Yep. yep. Thank yep. you all. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. Yeah, thank very you. much so.